Hi there, I'm Shannon Rice, part of the podcast team here at C-SPAN. We wanted to use the Afterwards feed while the program takes a holiday break and share one of our other podcasts, Book Notes Plus. Taking the concept from Brian Lamb's long-running Book Notes TV program, the podcast offers listeners more books and authors. Book Notes Plus features a mix of new interviews with authors and historians, along with some old favorites from the archives. The platform may be different, but the goal is the same. Give listeners the opportunity to learn something new. Follow so you never miss an episode. Afterwards, we'll be back publishing in this feed on January 8th. The book is called Wasps. And in this case, it stands for White Anglo-Saxon Protestants. The subtitle for the New York lawyer Michael Knox Barron's examination of the wasp culture is The Splendors and Miseries of an American Aristocracy. The people featured in the book are familiar names from history. Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt, Dean Acheson, Henry Adams, Averill Harriman, T.S. Eliot, Walter Lippmann, Joe Alsop, and Whitaker Chambers, to name a few. Author Barron's publisher, Pegasus, writes that wasps were creatures of glamour, power, and privilege, yet they were unhappy. Michael Knox Barron, we should start by you defining what a wasp is. Well, I think the best way to understand them, Brian, is that they were, I would call them displaced Brahmins, people who were descended from, uh, really from the founders of the country, the people that shaped, invented the uh, American Republic. And yet after the Civil War, they found themselves being overshadowed uh, in a very different world. It was now dominated by uh, plutocrats, tycoons, urban party bosses, and they could no longer play the, the sort of civic part that they were accustomed to. The historian Richard Hofstetter has described them as patricians without a purpose. And what I think is interesting and uh, sort of larger point about, about them is the way they reinvented themselves at that point. Um, they were appalled not just by the changes in the power structure of America, but by what seemed to them a sort of narrowing of purpose, that it, the country had lost some of the idealism that it had had at the founding. And they uh, sort of tried to you know, create a sort of new kind of humanism in which they would uh, participate in different activities, sort of get them out of their own funk and make a contribution to the country. Name some of your favorite wasps. Well, I think the, the the guy you have to begin with is Henry Adams. He He's descended from two presidents. His grandfather is John Quincy Adams. His father is John Adams. And in some ways, it was an impossible legacy to live up to, and he very much felt that. What was he going to do with his life? What he ended up sort of doing is saying that um, – we need to form a class of public-spirited people who can counter some of the, the narrowness of American life, who could uh, sort of keep a larger idea of what it might mean to be a free country in an industrializing age. So you have him as an early exponent of what the Roosevelts would do in uh, their public service, uh, laying the foundations for a basically for the modern welfare state. But he would also, at the same time, was interested in a whole other aspect of uh, WASP culture, which is you know, bringing museums to cities, creating schools that will really uh, reach the soul and um, uh, allow people to develop their potential. What do you think his reaction would be if he came back today, went to the location of his old house, which is now the Hay Adams Hotel, the location is, and walked out of the hotel and saw something called Black Lives Matter Plaza. I think he would understand that that is progress. Uh, his own family were an anti-slavery family. They 
that said, they did not really live up to the uh, the idea of actually taking people who are not from their own uh, class and uh, ethnic group seriously as full equals. And I think he would be impressed that the country the country was now doing a much better job at things that he and his ancestors had aimed at but had fallen short in. Well, what if he'd have walked that said, uh, while he would like, he would understand Black Lives Matter, I think he would sort of be appalled by the, uh, the, whole, the way the whole cityscape had grown up with the gigantic buildings and uh, a kind of culture that um, didn't speak to that wholeness of, of, of human potential, which was so essential to, to, to his own life and indeed to the H.H. H. Richardson house that he uh, built on Lafayette Square right next to John Hayes. What kind of money did he have? They were comfortable. I mean, his grandfather, Peter Brooks, was one of the richest men of America in his time. The fortune was divided but uh, among children and grandchildren, but Henry never, uh, he never had to work for a living. He, he worked as a professor at Harvard, but uh, the income from the family trusts while he would complain about being a poor man compared to, say, John Hay, who married the daughter of one of the richest men in Ohio, the Watts were very comfortable, which I think is interesting. This is partly why they supported some of the progressive reforms that Theodore Roosevelt and later Franklin Roosevelt would champion. They were not anti-capitalists. They weren't radicals. They didn't want to, uh, they didn't want to destroy that. They had a lot of property they wanted to keep. They thought the best way to do that, though, in a, a changing, industrializing economy was to provide a safety net, to provide some social security for people who were uh, falling behind. Tell me if I'm right about this. You went to Groton. You went to Columbia University. You went to Cambridge where you got a master in philosophy. And then you got a law degree from Yale. Is that right? That's right. Yep. You write a lot about Groton. What? Is it like today or when you were there compared to what you're writing about in your book about wasps? Well, I think that Groton was uh, Henry Adams, his two nephews were there, and Franklin Roosevelt was there. Theodore Roosevelt was a good friend of its headmaster, and a kid Peabody, who offered him a job of teaching there. Teddy didn't teach. He went out west instead, but he sent his sons there. And that school became a real... Uh, impetus for the kind of wasp culture that was going to take people that could sit around and lounge all day in their clubs on their trust funds. And they were going to turn them into sort of public spirited citizens who would take a role in public service, but who would also, you know, do the other things of, about making uh, a, a humane contribution to the communities in which they found themselves. And Groton did that by really taking on pre-modern ideas about how you really reach young souls that are very common in all kinds of uh, older communities, going back to Athens, where you use great literature or poetry to sort of open the mind and help it realize its potential. This, this, this Greek idea, Renaissance idea, was really crucial to the Wasp revival, and it ended up working, and it did produce a class of uh, these sort of civic civic generalists, I would, I would call them, who made contributions in various aspects of American life. Who was Joe Alsop? He was uh, an interesting character who was both a wasp who analyzed it very shrewdly. He described his class as sort of the wasp ascendancy. He described the uh, different what he called recognition signals that would allow wasps to sort of identify each other wherever they found themselves, you know, certain manners, dressing, speaking, laughing, what they considered funny, inside jokes. He described a lot of the, how their power operated, their privilege. But at the same time, he was also very much uh, trying to live that wasp idea that you will do uh, justice to different aspects of your nature, this old sort of Renaissance ideal or Athenian ideal. It meant a lot to him because he became a great, newspaper columnist, Cold War hawk, but he was also interested in the rare art traditions, collected all kinds of Asian antiquities and art, tremendously knowledgeable about uh, literature, was famous for the sort of style of his house 
and the style of the entertainments he gave there, which were very sort of sophisticated, almost in the fashion of the old Athenian or Greek uh, symposia, which are supposed to be, you know, not just having fun, but having fun on sort of a higher plane where the fun leads to talk about, you know, what, what should we, do, we be doing in life? What's the, what's the point of life? That kind of broad, philosophic uh, approach to life. As you know, he lived in Georgetown, and he um, had a certain way of talking. Um, almost sounds European. He let our cameras in there in 1984 in December. Twice we got to talk with him over a period of a couple of hours. I'm going to run just a little clip so people can hear what he sounded like. And at one point, he was incredibly visible in Washington in the Washington Post. But here is what he sounded like. And just keep in mind, he had a, always had a cigarette in his hand. I went to Brockton. Prep uh, school. And yes. And um, I was a rather friendless boy when I was little. And I made friends when I was 13, 14. I'd learned that it was a bore not to have friends. And uh, and uh, they were going to Harvard, so I went to Harvard, that's all. And uh, it certainly wasn't an ideal educational ex experience, if you mean that. Um, I read enormously. I enjoyed myself enormously. I drank enormously. In fact, I'm a news I became a newspaper man because my family were afraid if I stayed at Harvard news uh, Law School, which might have been my intention, I'd turn into a drunk like all my mother's uncles. <laughs> Probably would have, too. Mr. Barron, your reaction? Well, it, replaying that, uh, it, it, it does bring to mind just how eccentric, though, their manners and ways of speaking and... Uh, that whole aspect of their of their uh, sort of character was, but it's quite charming and I think quite powerful. And it it, it again speaks to the way that they were uh, determined to do justice to what was in them. The rest of the world be damned if they didn't like it. I mean, few people could speak with that kind of. Uh, uh, idiosyncrasy that Joe Alsop does in, in those memorable C-SPAN interviews. In your book, you quote Walter Lippmann in a letter he wrote to Learned Hand. Before I read one little bit of it, who was Walter Lippmann? Uh, one of Joe Alsop's rival columnists, uh, one of the great 20th century columnists, got his start under uh, in the Bull Moose era of Theodore Roosevelt, knew every president quite well or somewhat well, and tremendous shaper of American opinion for much of the 20th century, up through, his, uh, up through the 1960s anyway. How are you able to be a wasp when you're Jewish? Well, I, 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 I think the wasps I'm dealing with in the book, it really becomes almost more of a state of mind than just a particular uh, ethnic or genetic strand. Obviously, most of them were white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, and probably most were, in fact, Episcopalians within Protestantism. But you have people like Bernard Berenson, the art critic, Walter Littman, who were taken not so much, I think, with the the snobbish aspect of the wasps, their exclusive clubs, but precisely with their idea of humane education and developing your own potential. That's Walter Littman. He was at Harvard and studied under uh, William James and Santiana, the philosopher who expanded his mind. Bernard Berenson, very much the same thing. They, it was that aspect of wasdom that I think attracted them and uh, which sort of which made them what I would call honorary wasps. You could see a little bit of it in John F. Kennedy, I think, too. In the book, you refer to his Lippmann's book, Public Opinion, published in 1922, and The Phantom Public, which appeared in 25. And I'm going to read what he said. I'll take it slow so people can absorb it. He said, my own mind has been getting steadily anti-democratic, he wrote to Learned Hand in 1925. The size of the electorate 
the impossibility of educating it sufficiently, the fierce ignorance of these millions of semi-literate, priest-ridden and parson-ridden people have gotten me to the point where I want to confine the action of the majorities. What do we think of that today? Well, this goes really to the heart of one of the contradictions of, of the WASPs. They wanted to be a patrician class that would uh, would guide public opinion and uh, the rest of the country, yet they always maintained that they were not going to be aristocrats. And Joe Alsop is very, very adamant, very sensitive on this point. When George Kennan, uh, the great diplomat, once said to Alsop, you know, Joe, the trouble with this country is that we are a democracy and we instead should be ruled by aristocrats. Alsop replied that, well, you know, I, I was very nearly sick when, when George said that. He said, you know, there are no aristocrats in America. This is, we're a uh, egalitarian nation. But there was always this tension uh, between being good public-spirited citizens of a democratic republic, yet wanting to influence it and mold it uh, for what they thought would be its, its, its better good. I count about four books that you've written. Ninety-eight, you did The Last Patrician, Bobby Kennedy, 2003, Jefferson's Demons, Portrait of a Restless Mind, 2007, Forge of Empires, 61 to 71. You wrote about Abraham Lincoln and Otto von Bismarck and Tsar Alexander II. And then you had the 2015 Murder by Candlelight and now this book on wasps. What else do you do? Uh, Well, until... I, 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 by profession, a lawyer, though I'm now retired. And where do you live? I, I live in Westchester County, New York, uh, about an hour's drive outside of New York City. As I pointed out earlier, you were a Groton student. You were a Columbia student in New York, then Cambridge in Great Britain, and then Yale. Could you fit in the WASP group today or even back then in the 20s and 30s? No, in the 20s and 30s, uh, um, my grandfather came over on a boat from Austria-Hungary in May 1914. Um, it, it would have been very unlikely for somebody like him to have attended Groton. Uh, he would have been in the class in the 1920s. Um, but the WASP did uh, play a part in establishing our meritocracy and opened up their school. So I came to Groton as a, as a I guess, Alsop would have called a tribal outsider, but it welcomed us outsiders, and uh, I think it did give us, I hope, the good aspects of the WASPs, their their desire to uh, uh, do justice to their powers and try to live lives that aren't just uh, narrowly successful in a particular groove, but with some mindfulness of uh, contributing to the community and to... Uh, developing a broad array of interests in a sort of old, humane uh, tradition. How did you get into this book? How long did it take you? And I can tell you as someone who considers himself a generalist and not an intellectual, this book requires time because you have lots of big words in it. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's the, the, uh, the disagreeable aspect of a, a Groton education is uh, <laughs> being too wordy. <laughs> Joe, Joe Alsop was certainly, uh, I guess, verbose and quite uh, ornamental in his style. But uh, it took me three years, and it, uh, I guess it was my way of trying to understand that the institutions that had shaped me were, in fact, at the, you know, they were, they were WASP institutions, and I was trying to sort of come to come to grips with what that meant and uh, who were these people that have had a great influence, not only on me, but anybody who attends any of these schools that they have founded or visits one of the museums that they subsidized. And uh, uh, there was a re interesting article written by uh, Samuel Goldman, uh, professor of political science at uh, George Washington University, saying that though the WASPs have lost their place in uh, uh, 
as shapers of American culture today. They're no longer the people that hold the offices. Their institutions are still some of the dominant ones that shape our larger, larger cultural life. And he said, you know, they sort of won by losing. A word that you use a lot in your book, and <clears throat> correct me if I pronounce it incorrectly, uh, neurasthenia. Yeah, neurasthenia. What, what does the word mean, and why did you use it so often? Well, it, it, in Greek it means uh, unhealthy nerves or sick nerves, but what the wasps understood it as, as sort of the funk they fell into in the Gilded Age when they felt they were falling behind in life. They weren't living up to the traditions of their ancestors. They were like Henry Adams and feeling uncomfortable with their their lack of an impact on their country. So I think it was a great a great motivator of the wasps to try and get out of their lassitudes and do something. And that's what they did. And I think their methods of education, of uh, sort of forming character, this sort of stuff that's now considered a little bit dodgy and old fashioned. In fact, I think the wasps found that sort of uh, character molding quite effective in getting them uh, getting them up and doing things. Here, here's a word I looked up and could not find a definition. And I need your help on this. I'll probably mess this pronunciation. Plasgua goraza. Yes, I think that's, a, that's sort of a combination of the different uh, civic centers, the Roman Forum, the Greek Agora, the old marketplaces that were... Um, before the days of TV and radio and books, people got their, their culture, their ideas of, you know, history, their, their news from these places that were at the center of every local community. And they developed quite extraordinary methods of, uh, of influence pe influencing people and sort of influencing their, their character. This was very much the Athenian uh, idea of Pericles, that we're going to produce what he called uh, citizens that can be good at not just one thing, but many things, this sort of broad-minded approach to citizenship. And the wasps, I think, were always attracted to that idea. They all went on sort of grand tours of Europe and other pre-modern cultures, not just in Europe, but also in Asia. And they came away thinking that this is sort of what's missing in America. We don't have any longer these kinds of centers where people can in a social setting, uh, encounter things that will sort of develop their own inner uh, potential or aspirations. I want to go back to Joe Alsop just for a second and run another clip because, it, again, it, it, it's the sound of his voice and what he says that I want you to talk about. Old-fashioned snobbery. I mean, no, don't mean social snobbery, but intellectual snobbery is disapproved of, um, which it is in this country. It's not in England. Or in, or in Europe, um, um, uh, uh, if intellectual snobbery is disapproved of, the standard goes down. It's 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 inevitable. Did you ever consider yourself an intellectual snob? Yes, I am certainly. Oh, you still are. <laughs> yes, I, I much prefer the first rate to the second rate. What is an intellectual snob? Can you define it and? Do you live around many people that consider themselves intellectual snobs? Do I? Yes, are we yes. Still on Joe? Or are we now to me? Well, both Joe and you. I mean, just talk about what he said and and uh, whether or not. It yes. No, I think that uh, that this was part of it. This was the idea that you, the wasp, believe that you that there are virtues to having an a certain kind of elite that. Uh, they will help cultivate taste. They will help. They will uphold standards. It's very much a, a part of uh, probably the great novelist who was an honorary wasp, Henry James. It's a great theme in his his novel that the old uh, elites of Europe, the aristocracies, were tremendously terrible in many respects in the unfairness of their privilege. But he said that you know without them we would not have had a lot of the civilization uh, we have had you know all that artwork in the museums 
was partly the result of patrons and an elite that was looking to distinguish the better artists from the worse. worse. I mean, that's why you have Raphael's work in the, uh, in the Vatican or Michelangelo's was this, uh, this desire for excellence, which uh, I think that's what was very much on Alsop's mind. And what about today? Is there snobbery in the United States today? And where do you see it? I, 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 don't, I think the intellectual snobbery has come down since. since I, I don't think there's as much of it, which can be both good and bad. I think if you look at the way we talk, we write, it's all much more, we're much more welcoming and open. On the other hand, you could also say that our level of taste, if you go into the local supermarket or shopping mall, it's not quite what you would have experienced perhaps in uh, Venice or some old European center where there would be a great deal of art and uh, poetry and sort of a larger conception of human possibility. I'm looking at chapter 29 of your book. And there's a picture of Whitaker Chambers, and it, underneath it it says, A washed radical, Whitaker Chambers helped mobilize forces that would doom the ascendancy of his kind. Put him in perspective in the WASP world. Well, Whitaker was uh, born from a WASP family that was going downhill. Unlike the Adamses or the Roosevelts uh, or the Alsops, they were losing their position, losing their money. Whitaker Chambers was, uh, yet he imbibed partly from his experience at Columbia, where there was a uh, humanities program that had been influenced by, indirectly by Harvard humanists. He had this idea of doing justice to his own potential, and he saw no way to reconcile that ideal with the uh, Roaring Twenties. So he was not one to do things by half measures. He became a communist. Ten years in the Communist Party convinced him that, uh, well, as he said, I heard the screams, and he became a founder of the modern conservative movement. But his whole, his whole, his basic uh, approach to life didn't change. He shifted uh, across the political spectrum, but he, you know, he had this farm in Maryland where he thought he could do justice to aspects of his nature that. He couldn't do. His day job was as a very successful writer for Time magazine, but he thought, you know, you need to have a broader set of interests in life. So uh, that was Whitaker Chambers carrying the WASP humanism into a into the mid 20th century, while at the same time becoming quite critical of the mid century WASP elite, which he thought Dean Acheson, for example, was insufficiently. Um, tough on communism, which I don't know if that, I think Whitaker himself backed off of that, but uh, uh, Dean Acheson was quite a, quite a convinced and dedicated uh, cold warrior. You mentioned the the next person I'm going to bring up several times in the book, and I kind of want to get at the question by asking you about when you hear somebody say, and if this, I don't care if it's a social setting or friends or whatever, that they've just finished reading Marcel Proust's Remembrance of Things Past. What, what, what is that? What, would, what vibe does that send out to somebody? And have you read it, by the way? Yeah, I've read it um, in English, but not French. But uh, uh, I guess it would be, I guess it's a snobbish vibe, but um, uh, it's, it's a work that. I'm trying to think how I would connect it to. Well, character, I mean, it's 3,000 pages, seven different volumes. Um, I once interviewed Shelby Foote when he was alive, and he used to say that when he would finish writing, uh, you know, several hundred thousand words about the Civil War, he would entertain himself for a couple of months by reading Marcel Proust's Remembrance of Things Past. And as you well know, it's not exactly easy reading. Why do people yeah. read it, and how does it fit into the. I think it spoke to WASPs a lot because it covers some of the issues which they were very much involved in. Proust is dealing with the difference between old elites and new elites. He's describing a, a waning old French aristocracy coming to terms with uh, new classes that are rising up, with uh, people who are 
rich American heiresses are marrying French princes and the, the difficulties of maintaining elite standards in a changed age. I think that would have spoken tremendously. It spoke tremendously, for example, to Edmund Wilson, who is, in addition to being one of the greatest American critics of the 20th century, was very much influenced by Watts' culture. And it was probably Wilson's uh, first book, Axel's Castle, that introduced a lot of English-speaking readers, or at least helped English-speaking readers, understand what Proust was doing and what, we, what he was about. Let me go back to, we were talking about education earlier. If you went to the University of Illinois and you went to a public high school in Chicago and you didn't go beyond that, what's the difference for somebody that went to Groton, Columbia, Cambridge, and Yale? I mean, not, you know, what, <clears throat> can, can you get the same education if you don't go to these elite schools on the East Coast? Oh, yes, yes, you can. Um, it, I think it's, it, education really depends. The wasps that uh, show up in my book were ones that responded to uh, certain aspects of their education. As Endicott Peabody lamented, uh, his Groton graduates, a lot of them, you know, most of them are, are not interested in those kinds of things and are, you know, content to uh, be stockbrokers. But there are, there, I think there's a certain... Uh, there's a certain self-selection involved. Yes, I think you'd be more likely to be exposed to it if you've gone through to schools that have maintained some of these old uh, humanities approaches to education. But uh, anybody that opens a book and is moved by it uh, can get very much the same kind of education. As you went through the writing of this book and researching this book, who were your favorites? Where, Where did you find the most joy out of researching and writing? I frankly came to really uh, enjoy hanging out with Joe Alsup uh, sort of uh, vicariously. What a character. Uh, his humor is, is, is very – he was not an altogether pleasant man. I mean, he, he bullied his wife. He put, got up in the morning and seemed to spend a lot of his day putting people in their place. Could be a terrific snob, but uh, extremely entertaining. Um, I think Edmund Wilson's another – Wasp character whose uh, uh, his writings uh, he helped introduce English speaking readers to Proust, as we were saying, and uh, uh, carried on a lot of the sort of Wasp ideal of developing different aspects of your nature and personality into the 20th century and left quite a remarkable record in that way. What do you want people to take? For, let me ask it different. Who do you envision reading the book, and then what do you want them to take away? Hmm. It's hard to. I think one of the problems with writing today is the division between the creator, the writer, and the audience. It's been quite a problem, really, ever since printed books came. Before, you know, you had. We were talking about these centers of old pre-modern life where everybody gathered for entertainment and news and understanding the world in a compact civic space. And there, the person that had the artistic or creative vocation would, he knew his audience, they were right there. You see somebody like Shakespeare is right on sort of the fringe between the world of playing for a particular audience in person and then writing impersonally for people who will read it about in books. So while I can't, you can't really know your audience in that way today, I would say that uh, anybody who's sort of tempted a little bit by this wasp idea of uh, they would phrase it, I think, is an idea of human completion of uh, of of not discarding certain aspects of your nature for you might for which you might not find an immediate outlook and uh, outlet in life. At the same time, though, I, I guess I would caution any person who takes the wasp humanist ideal too seriously is that it's something that's becoming ever harder to to pursue or cultivate in life. The wasps, of course, many of them, you know, they had trust funds and private income. They could, uh, they had a certain margin in life where they could develop different aspects of themselves. I think that's much harder to do now. I mean, if you work at a job, you really 
you've got to do your best in that job. And it's much harder to, uh, to live that broad-minded ideal that the WASPs had. And it could, I suppose, in some circumstances actually be harmful. What did they think of money? Oh, well, they loved it. I mean, Joe also said, what's the definition of success in America? He said, it's money, and that's a good thing. That's the, they, uh, they knew it was important. I think they, because they had it in general, uh, they had ancestors who'd made it for them. They could take a more, uh, they didn't worry, a lot of them didn't have to worry about it as much as, most of us do. I mean, Franklin Roosevelt, for example, uh, he could never have pursued the career that he did without uh, the fact that his mother's money paid for it for the for most of it. Other than the big names that you write about, the, the Wasp, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, Eleanor uh, Roosevelt, and Teddy Roosevelt, who were some of the other names that, of people that you write about that had an, as, uh, an important impact on the United States? Well, I think um, somebody, Endicott Peabody and William Emery Gardner, the founders of Groton, are not going to be very well known to most people. But uh, they founded a school where they did try and uh, create this sort of what Richard Hofstetter, the historian, called a little Greek democracy for the elite. This was, this was you know, the idea that you were going to create a little mini Athens and use it to shape people's, uh, young people's minds. And... They did that, and by some definitions, you'd say it really worked. It was a success. Now, I quoted you uh, uh, saying a couple things about Franklin Roosevelt and his wife um, and his Franklin Roosevelt's mother. You said that his mother, Sarah, was a tight-fisted old witch, and you called— She could be mean, yes. You called Franklin a charming yeah. man, and then you said Eleanor omitted— to shave her armpits. Uh, what brought it that kind of thing on for you when you were writing about this? Oh, I thought these interesting details in life are, uh, it's just interesting. This was a piece of, uh, when one of the Roosevelt uh, sons married uh, into another uh, Wasp family, the Cushing sisters, they were, uh, the Cushings were sort of alarmed that Eleanor was so, uh, uh, what would be the right word? So, I guess advanced or um, uh, heedless of conventions in her behavior, and they did note, notice the uh, they notice the armpits. But yeah. I think these details make his, history interesting. I mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to leave that out. It's just to me, it was an interesting thing. I would never have occurred to me to even think about, but there it was in in the record. How did Babe Paley get in your book? And who was she? Well, she was one of the, 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 the fabulous Cushing sisters who they all married into uh, quite well-known Wasp families, the Roosevelts, the Whitneys, and uh, had a great impact on the uh, fashion of twentieth century, mid-20th century life. I mean, before Jacqueline Kennedy, it was really Bay Paley who was the, the swan that uh, that people looked up to as a model of sort of style, elegance, uh, good living in, in the 20th century. But Babe Paley was married to Bill Paley, who owned CBS, by and large. Um, and, yes, that's a, that, yes. Yeah, but, but the reason I... That was her second marriage. The reason I mentioned that is because what was their relationship? <clears throat> and then what, where did Truman Capote come into this? Well, uh, Bay Paley was initially married to Stanley Mortimer, a uh, Standard Oil heir. That marriage didn't work. And I think uh, uh, Bill Paley was, by WASP standards of the day, a sort of exotic character, sort of uh, very successful man, very uh, dominating. At a time when the WASPs were starting to sort of lose their, I guess we would say, mojo, their, their, uh, their charisma or whatever it is that allows you to to dominate. So Bill Paley, she marries him, and he's, he is uh, really a dominant figure in the mid-20th century, shaping a lot of the stuff that those of us of a certain age you know, grew up with watching on television. So she sort of is a wasp who learned to accommodate herself to a new world. And what was their marriage like? I don't know. It, it lasted, but there seemed to have been tensions, but I suppose that can be true of many marriages.
Another name in, in uh, literary history that uh, you mentioned several times in the book is Dante. Who was he and why do you use him a lot to uh, describe some of these fe- people? Yes, he was a, a poet from Florence in Italy, and his Divine Comedy is a story of how he enters hell and goes up through purgatory and finally reaches paradise. It was a book that the wasps, at the, when they sort of reinvented themselves after the Civil War, uh, turned to all the time. So you can't read their their writings, their letters, without uh, feeling how much he spoke to them. And I think it was the idea that uh, you may find yourself in sort of a hellish place in life, but there is there is hope that you can get out in Dante's words, get out of the dark places and find a place uh, where you can see the stars. What was the most valuable research you found in this, and where did you find it? Well, I would have to say it was uh, probably attending the the WASP schools that I did because uh, that really gave me some understanding of what was going on that I could never have done just by reading books. What did you think of it when you were there? I liked it. I thought it was actually, it was very much what Peabody and Gardner tried to do in my time. Uh, There had been a whole other element in between at Groton uh, that was not so pretty. Uh, There was a lot of hysteria about uh, sexuality in, in an earlier period in the 20th century. So there was a lot of uh, bullying and things, things of that nature that were meant to keep the, keep the boys in line. I think that explains why Joe Alsup, who was very grateful for the, the teaching he got at Groton, found it a very unpleasant experience with the bullying and the, uh, the institutional hazing, which by my time uh, had been eliminated. Is it today men only? No, um, girls were admitted in the mid 1970s, and um, uh, two of my daughters have gone there, and it's uh, it remains a I think a very special place, and uh, 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 one that I think uh, really does remain true to what I think was one good aspect of the old wasp idea, which is to try and take uh, take a person and bring out their bring out their talents and abilities. I think I I wrote it down. I think this is a quote from you, um, and I wanted you to explain it. Beware of boredom with public officials. It sounds... uh, (laughs) Yeah, I don't know what what context I was quoting it, but... uh, Well, beyond that, you say FDR was bored with domestic uh, uh, policies and, uh, and, and... that that yeah, might have I think had... FDR always liked he he just liked action and and change and he he was a very very restless man. Um, uh, he didn't sit through meetings following sort of charts about what he he, he mostly talked. Yet somehow he managed just through sort of joking and talking through all these meetings to navigate the country through a bunch of major crises. He's quite a mystery as to how exactly he did that. Uh, So the rest of your education, what did you take away from Columbia? Well, there it was, they had this core curriculum, which had been inspired, um, a Harvard professor uh, who'd been educated at Harvard, George Woodbury, had been, uh, came to Columbia, and one of his students created uh, the series of humanities courses that are known as the core curriculum. Whitaker Chambers uh, experienced them, first studied Dante, who was an important influence on Chambers' life in the Columbia core curriculum. And probably its most notable uh, exponent, the person who spoke about it most eloquently, was the critic Lionel Trilling, who was not in any sense a wasp by birth, but who found the um, core curriculum uh, a, a tremendous sort of, I, I would say, I guess, life-changing would be the word we'd use now, a life-changing experience in his uh, idea of how great works of art, the imagination, can uh, shape the soul or liberate its potential. What did you take away from Cambridge? 
Cambridge, you sort of see uh, aspects of an older community that uh, has maintained some of these humane standards of learning for centuries. So it's sort of a little awe-inspiring for an American who, when we're in a place that's one or two hundred years old, we think it's quite ancient, whereas you go to Cambridge and you're continuously, continuously sort of surrounded or overshadowed by a culture that goes back almost a thousand years. And finally, what did you take away from Yale? Well, the good thing, or not good thing, depending, I guess, how you look at it, is Yale is very forgiving in terms of uh, letting students pursue their own interests. So you might not necessarily learn a lot of law if you don't want to, but you can feel free to uh, pursue your own interests. And Yale Law School is very generous in allowing students to uh, find ways to do that. How was this book experience compared to the other four you've written? Um, I, I think it was, uh, it, it, it's much stronger because I was reporting something that I just had some connection to personally, writing about Robert Kennedy or the 1860s with Lincoln and Bismarck, uh, you know, I'm getting it through books. Um, and while I'm not myself a, a wasp, uh, and not connected to wasps really by family or birth, uh, having experienced their institutions gave me, I think, uh, a feeling for things that were possibly overlooked in what they accomplished by other writers, even though the writings might be very illuminating. But to have actually gone through the experiences is just always very different. I've always thought if you could just, if a classical scholar could go to, say, the Roman Forum for five minutes, it would probably alter his perspective on the whole thing tremendously, just because he'd seen it even for a brief time. Uh, and that's sort of how I feel about uh, writing about the WASP experience. Your name, Michael Knox Barron. Where does Knox come from? My mother's family. They were, they would, I guess, be technically WASPs in the sense of uh, uh, genetics or whatever. But they weren't. They were from the Midwest, so they didn't. They weren't in touch with the the culture I sort of be, got introduced when I went to uh, to boarding school. Any relationship to uh, Henry Knox, the former Secretary of War? I don't think, no, no, I don't think so, no. Or if, if, if it would be, it would be very distant. And the name Barron, where does that come from? Well, my grandfather in 1914 came from uh, what was then Austria-Hungary. He was living in Croatia. I think the name is 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 more commonly found uh, in the Czech Republic, but... Uh, I, I suppose this was another aspect of uh, my experience in writing the book. Like many Americans, I'm a, a melting pot creation of different traditions and different uh, uh, cultural heritages, which is a great thing. But you find with each generation, the cultural strength sort of peters out as everybody sort of homogenizes things to get along. And it was an experience to go to a school like Rotten, which in some ways hadn't changed in some of its forms in almost 100 years to experience what I think anthropologists would call thick culture as opposed to the thinner culture that uh, is more characteristic of our modern homogenized life. And that, uh, that was eye-opening to see that at the age of 13. Um, uh, as we wrap this up, I, I do have to ask you, did you like wasps? The people? Yeah. Yes, all of them I've known, they've actually been uh, charming, funny, quite uh, quite, quite good people. Um, that, that's been my experience. I, I, I never, by my time, the sort of, some of the eccentricities of Joe Alsop, though, had been much more leveled off. People didn't speak like that at Groton in the 1980s, uh, the way Joe Alsop was speaking. Um, that uh, the Wasps, too, have sort of thinned down their culture over the years. We got to do one more quote uh, from Joe Alsop because it, it it's his chance to drop names and get your reaction to this. Well, Henry Kissinger was the cleverest man I've ever known. The cleverest man you've ever yeah. known. And in, the man I admired most was General Marshall from his character. General Marshall to Harry Hopkins, curiously enough, at the end, when I got, really got to know him in the war. 
Dean Acheson was a most distinguished man. Bob Lovett was a marvelous man. I mean, it sounds as though I was talking about the remote past. Could you but just... It's very hard to see anyone that matches those men now. Mr. Barron? Well, of course, he's talking about um, people that... Dean Acheson and Bob Lovett are very much part of the WASP ascendancy. Dean Acheson was at Groton uh, two decades before, a decade before uh, Joe Alsop graduated. General Marshall maintained a, a similar old-fashioned, uh, I guess, cavalier tradition of gentleman-like behavior. So again, there was sort of a common denominator. And Henry Kissinger, you could almost say, is in some ways an honorary wasp. He went to Harvard and uh, took to heart its idea of developing different aspects of your nature, and you'd certainly say he did. Between his uh, extraordinary scholarship in diplomacy and his actual achievements as a, as, as a statesman and a and a public servant, uh, extremely impressive stuff. And uh, but with an underlying, I think, idea of developing developing his different talents and not just focusing on any one of them. Of all the people you write about in your book, which one would you most like to have dinner with? I suppose also, but well, except for the fact that he'd probably be bored and. Uh, when he was bored, he'd be awfully intimidating. But uh, he, he really, I think, thanks to those uh, C-SPAN interviews, you really can't see what a, what a, I mean, when you spoke to him, it must have been a very sort of interesting performance. I certainly found it so, seeing it on tape. Oh, absolutely. It was, uh, it's available for anybody that wants to watch him on our archives and there are a couple of hours of it back in 1984, but. Uh, it, it occurred to me, he's almost, it's almost as though, there was this sort of acting as theatrical aspect about him. Uh, he, he really dominates the camera with his mannerisms, his way of speaking, his pauses, his uh, the whole presentation, which I think probably did go into uh, other Wasp characters like Franklin Roosevelt, this sort of almost stagecraft in which they uh, presented themselves. <laughs> you should have tried to interview him. Anyway, Thank you, Michael Knox Barron. The book is called Wasps. The subtitle is The Splendors and Miseries of an American Aristocracy. Joy Dara Chet, thanks for joining us today. And uh, what's the next you, book? Brian. What's the next book? Not sure yet. <laughs> Not sure yet. Well, good luck. We'll, we'll talk to you again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. Thanks for listening. Please rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at podcasts at c-span.org.